Tonight, acts of defiance not seen in a generation. Massive protests spreading across China, the largest since Tiananmen Square. I really think that the government's policy against the COVID is like too strict. In the, it's violating our rights as a common human. Do you think people are afraid? Are you afraid? I'm not afraid. It's Monday, November 28th, 2022, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining social, economic, political, and geopolitical concerns. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a Hoover Distinguished Policy Fellow. I'll be your moderator today. Looking forward to a spirited conversation between our three Goodfellows, as we call them. That would be the historian Neil Ferguson, the economist John Cochran, the geostrategist Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster. They are Hoover Institution's senior fellows all. And gentlemen, let's begin this broadcast with a confession from me, your humble moderator. I am lazy. I came with no topic in mind today, so I am throwing the ball in your respective courts. I've asked each of you to come prepared with a topic you'd like to bring up. John Cochran, since you go by last name uh, alphabetically, even your trade economist comes before geostrategist historian, I'll let you do the honors. You lead off. <laughs> well, I, I turned that around and said, come prepared with a question to ask of your uh, fellow uh, good fellows. And so I'll ask you guys who know more about, uh, about it than I do, what's going on with China and COVID protests and so forth? Hey, well, Neil spent a lot more time than I did there. So, Neil, you should, you should take us first. Take, take it, Neil. Well, it's remarkable, uh, as somebody who spent five years as a visiting professor at Tsinghua, to see protests on the Tsinghua campus. That's one of the two big uh, universities in Beijing, uh, near a building that I know well. And those uh, protests are more than merely protests about the COVID restrictions. Uh, and this is an important point uh, to begin with. Uh, the, um, the, the things that people are chanting are, and I'm going to quote uh, uh, the words that were being used at the Tsinghua protest I saw a video clip of, democracy, rule of law, freedom of expression, scientific reason, integration with the world. Those are not... Uh, words that you would expect to be chanted uh, by a crowd of protesters uh, at a Chinese university. They're highly significant because those are the things that Xi Jinping said they weren't allowed to talk about anymore on Chinese universities several years ago in a crackdown on academic freedom in China. So uh, point number one, this goes way beyond the COVID restrictions. Now, the news version of this is there was a fire in Urumqi, a bunch of people died because the COVID restrictions <clears> led <throat> the fire escapes to be welded shut. That's certainly been the catalyst, but the scale and uh, the ambition of these protests uh, is greater than anything we've seen in China since uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989. So these are extraordinary events. I'll say one more thing uh, before I hand it to HR. It's highly unlikely that these uh, protests will lead to the downfall of Xi Jinping, if that's what you were wondering. Uh, we, we have a tendency in this country to, to think that revolutions have a higher probability of success than they generally do, maybe because we had such a successful one here. Uh, in reality, I'm talking, of course, about the uh, 1770s, uh, not about any more recent events, the reality is that the Chinese Communist Party probably has more power of coercion over its population than any regime in history. And I'm afraid the harsh reality is that as is happening in Iran as we speak, so soon in China, there will be a brutal crackdown. And those people who have bravely called for greater freedom in China will find themselves in relatively short order in prison cells. That's my take. HR. What I think is significant about these protests is I think it exposes what we might call you know, the bigotry masquerading as, as cultural sensitivity that you often hear among uh, Americans and others who debate uh, about the nature of China society, in which you hear people make the argument that, hey, the, the Chinese people are just culturally predisposed toward not wanting a say in how they're governed. And of course, I don't think any peoples are, are culturally predisposed to not wanting to say in how they're governed. And, and it has been, I think, the party's obsession with control, the recent efforts to extend and tighten the party's grip on power, uh, using the cover of the pandemic in, in part to, to do so, to perfect the technologically enabled Orwellian police state. 
to come up with these systems in which the <laughs> this this remote uh, command center changes the setting on your phone and you can no longer get into a supermarket or to a, to a restaurant or take public transit. So I, I, I think that what, what uh, Neil's predicting is correct, that there will be a brutal crackdown. I'm sure it's already ongoing, uh, you know, driven by the knowledge, right, the, the, and, uh, that, the, that the government has about individuals, the ability to police their thoughts even. Um, and, and, uh, but I think that crackdown will probably elicit even more, even more protests. And I think it, it, what I've really enjoyed seeing is how clever the protesters have been. You know, when, when after their, you know, after the, the, the police approached them for chanting directly against Xi Jinping or, or, or elements of his policies or demanding freedom and, 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 and rule of law, uh, they start to chant, we want more COVID tests, right? We, you know, we, they, 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 uh, they're, they're being sarcastic and, and, uh, and irreverent in creative, in creative ways. Holding up blank signs uh, is another way that they've been, been protesting. So uh, I think it's, we, we don't know. I think Neil's quite right to point out that it's, it's impossible to predict the future course here. But I do think what we're state going to see is the beginning of a cycle of an interaction uh, between the CCP and its mechanisms of control and, and people who are reeling it against those mechanisms of control because of this fire that sparked it. But it's the overall crackdown. We saw the Foxconn protests, uh, for, for example. I do think these protests will have even more economic impact uh, and exacerbate uh, what we've seen already as the party's destructive policies associated with zero COVID and the lockdowns and the crackdown in the tech sector. So yeah, I think as we've been warning for a long time, I think investors need to get their money the hell out of out of out of China. <laughs> and and uh and and we need to, to mitigate the geostrategic risk to those investments. This shouldn't doesn't necessarily have to be government policy, John. <laughs> you know, as I don't think it was what you fear uh with outbound investment screening and so forth. I hope the market now will begin to make the corrections that I think are are, are necessary given the fact that our hopes for China under the Chinese Communist Party clearly have not panned out. Can I ask you guys a question and then, then a comment? But first the question, um, <clears throat> how good is the Chinese government's control? We, normally the way this works is uh, protests like this boil up. The regime is, as you guys said, brutal in its crackdown. Uh, but ch does China not even have to be brutal? And, and, and things fall apart when the, uh, when the cops refuse to shoot into the crowd. But my impression of China, and maybe I'm overstating how good they are, is that they don't have to be brutal. They simply turn on the cameras, then they can track down every single person at a protest, and then they zero them out. And, you know, you can't go into a store, you can't go into whatever, and then the police know exactly who you are. And they can come two months later and knock on your door, and, and that's the end of that. Uh, are they that good, or is there a chance for protests to, you know, pro protests here, the protest comes, if you get away from the cops, you're done. Well, I was talking to a, a, an expert uh, uh, on China earlier today, and he gave it a, a zero percent probability that these right. uh, protests could uh, could somehow overthrow the regime or even lead to a, a, a forced political change at the top of the CCP. John, the, the, the kind of short answer to your question, which I base partly on my own experience, is that the social credit system in China is not complete and all uh, embracing. The traditional forms of social control and coercion that were built up by Mao Zedong are probably still as important. And those include the fact that the Chinese Communist Party has literally uh, at least one person, one member in every apartment block who's keeping an eye on on his uh, or or her neighbours, uh, there is a an extensive domestic policing system uh, with a budget comparable uh, with that of the military, and so uh, the the surveillance system that's been introduced to create a kind of panopticon in the last ten years or so with uh, facial recognition technology, ubiquitous cameras, that that's on that's coming on top of an existing totalitarian system that was already extraordinarily uh, comprehensive in its coverage. And, and that's why it would be really astonishing if these protests were somehow more successful than the protests of 1989, uh, which were, of course, brutally crushed by the deployment 
uh, of of tanks uh, into into central Beijing. I'm not sure it will come to tanks uh, this time. I think it's probably going to be uh, riot police and uh, and armored vehicles uh, in the real trouble spots. But you'd really you'd really be seeing something truly miraculous if popular protest in these conditions could could achieve could achieve anything. Really, I, I, I'm I'm sorry to be pessimistic about this, but I want to remind you that for weeks uh, on uh, U.S. and and Western social media, there were videos of heroic uh, protesters in Iran uh, protesting against the uh, enforcement of the uh, sartorial uh, restrictions on on women. Uh, we hear less and less about these protests because they are being crushed as as we speak. And repressive regimes in the early 21st century are really very well equipped to stamp out the kind of protests that were a big problem in the 18th and and in the 19th century in many countries. Uh, Over time, the states just got more powerful. And it takes a weak state to to lose control uh, of popular protests, a weak state like the weak states of Eastern Europe in 1989. So I do, I do want to object. The American Revolution was not painless. Uh, I think of all of our wars, it had the most deaths per capita uh, of any one. Uh, no, I'm pretty sure that was the Civil War, John. Uh, per capita, I'm not sure. The Revolutionary War might have outdone the Civil the, the War. The Civil War no. was much the bloodiest war in American history, including all but the it was The American Revolutionary War was quite bloody. However. No, actually, tell, tell, tell you something. The American uh, War of, uh, of Independence was quite a small war because Britain didn't really contest it uh, in the way that it contested the French Revolution. The, the French Revolutionary Wars were huge because Britain really yes. was determined to, right. to prevent that revolution from succeeding. But in the end, there were enough Whigs in, in Britain who broadly sympathized with uh, the patriots in, in the American colonies for it not to be that big a war. But that's a that's a footnote for our historian. And you've got you've got you've got to hand it to British incompetence also uh, in, the, in the British command. I mean, they did a great job in helping to defeat themselves, but also the you know the, the courage of the you know of the uh, of the you know the the uh, revolutionaries and and uh, and the assistance of the French. And but but uh, just to, not to get off topic, but it was if it is not the bloodiest per capita, I think it is the bloodiest war per capita. In American history, we'll have to look that up and, and let our viewers know by the end if we can finally get a fact checker on that. But it, but it, but of course, the the Civil War in real numbers was certainly the bloodiest. Hey, but I I would just say just a, a couple of things on this. You know, uh, Neil, I I would just say that I think it already is a brutal crackdown. It, it's an ongoing brutal crackdown. When you have you know at least 1.8 million Uyghurs in concentration camps, when you have Uyghur birth rates down by by 60 percent. Uh, I, I chalk that up to brutality, right? And 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 so I, I, the question is, how do the Chinese people respond to? I think what will be continued oppression, intensified oppression, uh, by the by the Chinese Communist Party. We just we just don't know, you know, we just don't know what will happen. Uh, Iran, uh, I think you're, you're right to point out that the that the protests have tailed off, but they're still continuing, especially in in the Kurdis region in Iran. And I don't think that if if the if the regime in China succeeds in in uh, in, in you know, dispersing these these uh, these protests, uh, I don't think that means that the, the dissent against the CCP goes away. I, you know, I don't know what you thought, but I, I mean, I the, just the the chance that you heard directly against Xi Jinping, directly against the party, I, I think those are those are unprecedented. Uh, uh, maybe at least, at least going back to 1989. So right. we, we could agree this is the beginning. In other words, uh, we've seen something very unusual. Now let's go ahead a few years and the lockdowns continue, the repression continues, the economy goes way, way down. You could have something that is that is serious. Let me, I let me turn it around. On, can I turn the tables on you, John? Because it does seem okay. to me that uh, uh, leaving aside analogies with, uh, with American history, which really are of pretty limited use thinking yeah, about China. Right. But let's think about this as an economics problem. Zero COVID seemed in 2020 like uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, wonderfully uh, effective solution to the problem of of COVID-19, leave aside the fact that COVID originated under the CCP. But it seemed to many people that lockdowns were the right way to deal uh, with uh, the, the spread of the virus. 
we we fast forward to late 2022 it's getting on for uh the third anniversary of the the pandemic and china is still using these non-pharmaceutical methods which are as we now know highly disruptive of economic activity uh, of course, it was obvious they were going to be disruptive in 2020, but me- most uh, supposed experts said that the cost would be uh, would be outweighed by the benefits. I think it's really hard to see how they can continue with this approach to the disease without fundamentally harming their economy, permanently damaging the consumer, particularly. Uh, but but I think broadly speaking, lowering the growth rate. Think. Tell us how you think about this, just as an economics problem, leaving aside the the politics of of protest. Um, Neil, I'm I'm very glad you asked that because that's exactly where I wanted to go with with a heretical thought. Uh, China has so far achieved pretty much zero COVID. Uh, now they have in this pandemic, they have the wrong answer to the problem, and they also catastrophically did not use their three years to vaccinate their whole population. Uh, and and let it open. And and when they open up, they're in, what's going to happen when this goes through? They don't have the the hospital capacity. Millions of people are going to die when a a population unexposed to this uh, has COVID running through it. But my horrible 2 a.m. thought is that they have the right answer to a different pandemic. Uh, Suppose our next pandemic kills uh, one in 10 people or 30%. There have been pandemics through history that do that and that we don't have um, on the weekend after the pandemic opens, our science does not give us a vaccine. Uh, then in fact, non-pharmaceutical interventions are the right thing. And what's amazing about China is how well the economy is doing despite uh, continued lockdowns. Um, now they have now used this system as an atrocious limit on civil liberties and, and to enforce a totalitarian regime. But when the next pandemic comes, uh, the one that kills 30% of the people who get it, uh, we will remember, oh, lockdowns don't work. And we will not have the capacity, as we still don't, for the basic public health that you can do uh, to stop a pandemic early, quick, before geometric growth meets bureaucratic inefficiency and it all blows up. We have the, the collective wisdom, ah, lockdowns were a mistake, which they were for this disease, but they're not necessarily a mistake for the next one. So our our uh, the, the problem is the thing we know how to do now opens up the door to to uh, totalitarian abuse of, of your civil liberties and political control. Uh, but on the other hand, we are not ready for that for that next one. If you want to get, you know, th- th- there's a there's conspiracy theorists who think uh, China developed this as a test case and they're ready to go with the, the one that comes out of a lab. That, that kills 30% of the people is, is also one that we're completely unready for. So uh, let's give China its, its due. They have a technology to keep the economy sort of running and lock down a different virus, uh, which we don't have. And we don't have that technology in place to both lock down the virus and maintain our civil liberties. Um, we just have the lesson, oh, lockdowns are a bad idea. Now that's not where you want it to go, where there's economy going in the future. Yeah, they're they're caught between a rock and a hard place. They now have to either keep this up for God knows how long, uh, or suffer COVID uh, rampaging through their uh, their their country, which will be politically difficult and economically difficult. And hey, it's just worth pointing out they don't have an mnra vaccine either. They don't have a vaccine. But they could. Before. You guys keep telling me how good they are at stealing intellectual property. What what took well, them hey, so long? I'm sure they're trying, John. But it really, they they tried to they tried to force you know, the uh, Western companies that, that are producing MNRA vaccines to transfer all the intellectual property to them yeah. uh, as the, as the, as the, as the price of entry into that, into that market and to provide it. And, and uh, of course they refused. And they right, cut right off their nose despite their faces. They could have just bought the stuff and vaccinated their whole population by now. If they could only have said, well, it's okay to import something and not take the intellectual property. I'm going to go down uh, the, the opposing uh, road uh, to you, John. I, I don't think, this conspiracy theory uh, has much substance to no, it. The, the uh, conspiracy theory does not, I, uh, I, and I didn't want to go there. And, uh, and, but but the our unpreparedness that, for a a a real you you you're the historian. You know the plagues that we've had. We are now not prepared to do the things that it takes to stop a plague from happening if we don't have the vaccine. And there is some uh, probability of of a kind of antibiotic resistant bubonic plague with a very high 
mortality rate. It's not a zero probability scenario, but it's it's probably a relatively low probability scenario compared with, uh, let's call it the base case, which is that China's zero COVID policy condemns uh, China's economy to much slower growth. There's no way out because if they were to open up now, at least a million mostly elderly Chinese would die and their relatively thinly spread healthcare system would be overwhelmed. So I think what we're really seeing here are the the pathologies of a centralized totalitarian regime uh, playing out in ways that that are are going to end China's economic miracle and return Chinese society to levels of of totalitarian control that that the Chinese haven't experienced really since the 1970s. And and what I'm inclined to think is actually the opposite of you. I'm I'm, I'm optimistic about this. Uh, For me, the 3AM thought is, well, at some point, this can't be sustainable. Uh, the, the system just can't possibly retain legitimacy with this combination of economic uh, slowdown, uh, repression, and uh, and what a bleak life. And that, that's part of, I think, what we're seeing here. The protests are not just political, and they're not just about public health. It's a protest against the sheer misery of life under recurrent lockdowns. So you, you're right, there's some probability that they're better prepared for Black Death 2.0 than we are, but it seems like the that's a low probability scenario compared with the quite high probability scenario that the Chinese Communist Party has reached the uh, point of diminishing returns. Its, its totalitarian system has sort of, it's sort of uh, gridlocked itself. It can only achieve social control and stabilize its public health system by killing its economy. And I think it is killing its economy, John. The growth rate's way down into low single digits this year, and it'll stay there as long as they as long as they have to persist with this policy. That's, to me, an optimistic inference. No, I, 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 think, guys, we're, I think we're agreeing with each other. I, I think um, 20, 40 years from now, the U.S. is in trouble because we don't have the non-pharmaceutical interventions they have. And in the next couple of years, exactly right. And and I, not just the protests we're seeing, but the Foxconn workers who, you know, at the hint of someone has COVID, what do they do? They run for the exits uh, be, and they're, they're willing to walk home because they know what's going to come in terms of being stuck in an apartment for months on end. Go ahead, HR. Yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to quote from our, our, our fellow, our visiting fellow here at Hoover's Late, latest book here. This is Frank Decoder's China After Mal. I just want to read the last two sentences because I think, John, you and Neil are agreeing, and I think you agree with Frank. In, in the last two sentences of this of the superb book, really the fourth book uh, in a series that deals with the history of the Chinese Communist Party, beginning with Mao's Great Famine was the first one that he wrote. Then he went backwards to the to to the or to to the uh, origins of, of the of the party and uh, up till 1949. Then he went uh, forward. Uh, to the Cultural Revolution, and then this is the fourth, the fourth volume. But but uh, but Frank Dakota writes the challenge lying ahead for the Communist Party was how to address an entire range of long-standing structural issues of its own making, without giving up its monopoly over power and its control over the means of production. It seemed very much like a dead end, and I think. I think the party has come to that dead end. Yeah. And and my comment really wasn't about China. It's about the U.S. and our unpreparedness to handle uh, a virus that kills a lot more people and that doesn't have a a quick vaccine or medical intervention. Although, John, it's worth uh, throwing out the hypothesis that if we had been confronted by a really dangerous disease, much more dangerous than COVID, we would probably have behaved quite differently. Part of what went wrong in the US, I think, and it was true in much of Europe, was that uh, belatedly, after it was too late, the policy decision was to do lockdowns. But people realized that this, in fact, wasn't really a credible strategy in the face of a disease that disproportionately killed the elderly. And so we we didn't really comply very effectively with these lockdowns. My sense is that we would have acted quite differently if COVID had been killing children at the same rates that it was killing uh, the no, elderly. No, no. So we don't know that exa- we would behave in exactly the same way if something really bad came along. Let, let's go back to our 2020 discussions. Uh, what we all realized was how bungling and how slow the answer was. And you kept reminding us how this is always the case. 
And uh, and the first reaction of all officials is, oh, don't, you know, it's not terrible. It's just the flu. It'll go away uh, to deny, deny until it's out of the, out of the bag. Uh, two to the N grows very quickly. And you have to be really ready to stamp on it quickly before it grows. And you have to have that plan in place. And we had all sorts of pandemic plans in place. And they just sat there on the shelf once again. Uh, so you really have to be ready ahead of time. To, to grab the non-pharmaceutical interventions while the cases are in the thousands before they're in the hundreds of thousands. Like okay. we do with smallpox. If you guys have said your piece on China, I'd like to move yes. on and hear Neil's question. Well, there was a sort of natural segue there to yes. uh, the question of academic freedom. Uh, wasn't there uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, John uh, and I attended a conference on academic freedom uh, here at Stanford. And, uh, I, I guess my question to you, John, since we're turning the tables on one another this week, is what did you learn uh, from that conference that you you helped to organize? So it, it was wonderful. And I, our listeners uh, and viewers, uh, Google up uh, Stanford Academic Freedom Conference, and you can find the schedule and full videos of all the participants. Uh, so I'll try for once in my life to bring it be short and I'll, I'll bring up one point at a time and you guys can ask if you want more points. The thing that struck me most uh, was um, not so much the tales of cancellation, just because we kind of know about those, but what's going on in the sciences. And we heard from some, and I, and I mean, the real sciences, sorry, not economics and not history, uh, but what's going on in the hard sciences, which have gone completely bats. Um, and so here, uh, Anna Krilov's presentation is a chemist from USC, Luana Maroja, who's a biologist, uh, Mimi St. John's, who's an anthropologist, were, were excellent. Dorian Abbott, who's a geophysicist uh, from Chicago. Uh, you would think that this, that uh, the lack of academic freedom problems are mostly in the humanities, social sciences, political discussions, but they're not. They're infecting hard science now in a big, big way. Uh, not just the, the DEI bureaucracy, which is, I think we're all for diversity, equity, and inclusion, but this is not about that. This is about political litmus tests, um, very reminiscent of what the Soviet Union <laughs> required in its purges. Uh, the number one thing you have to do in a DEI statement is, is show your the depth of your knowledge and uh, capacity to talk about DEI and pledge how you're going to work with the DEI office in the future. They, it is a political test explicitly. So the Department of Energy, uh, Anna Krilov pointed us to, is now requiring uh, this kind of thing. And the uh, the journals and professional societies are now, they have uh, both policies and, and edit, constant political editorials. Uh, the the most the 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 one that uh, shook me most was now the call for and already exists at Stanford offices uh, the the institutional review offices are expanding where before you do research you must submit to an institutional review of the social consequences of your research and how it might hurt marginalized populations uh, to the to the point of um, things that might uh, diminish employment can't be published. <clears throat> Sorry, Mr. Watt about that steam engine, but you know, it, it might have effects on the, the marginalized coal miners. Uh, things that are du potentially dual use technology are going to be, uh, are, 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 won't, won't be funded anymore, or you won't be allowed to publish uh, these things. This isn't quite in place yet, but that is what is uh, coming and, and most striking. So, you know, dual use technology. So something, you know, if, if, you're, if your chemistry or your, or your laser might be useful for shooting down Chinese missiles that are going to Taiwan, sorry, we can't uh, fund that sort of thing. So the, the, the politicization of, of hard science research was the thing that was newest to me and, and I think most shocking. And the segue that, that came to my mind as we were talking about uh, COVID and, and lockdowns was to uh, the presentations by our colleagues, Jay Bhattacharya uh, and Scott Atlas, right. uh, which reminded me of the ways in which supposed orthodoxy was imposed on the academic community on the question of the appropriate policy response to COVID. And those who dissented, as, as Scott Atlas and Jay Bhattacharya did, uh, were treated, I thought, abominably uh, by uh, the broader community of epidemiologists and, and medical experts. And this illustrates the danger, the, the danger of this kind of uh, limitation of academic freedom, that, that bad ideas 
become orthodoxy and and good ideas are are shut down, debate is shut down, one couldn't challenge, one couldn't question uh, the rightness of the the lockdown uh, policies, even when it was apparent that there were all kinds of unintended consequences. So I thought that was one of the most striking uh, features of the, the conference, that just in practical terms, if you lose academic freedom, if you lose the ability to contest what appears to be a nascent orthodoxy, then we will actually get worse at dealing with all kinds of uh, of, of problems. So I, I came away from the conference thinking, you know, academic freedom is, is really a terribly important thing. The reason they're protesting at Tsinghua is that academic freedom at that university right. has been stripped away uh, in, in a relatively short space of time that we should allow academic freedom to be undermined in a free society, in a democratic society, is one of the strangest phenomena of my lifetime. And you mentioned Anna Krylov. I want to just give a little quote from her recent article from Russia with Love, uh, because it's important to, to know that Anna Krylov began her career in the Soviet Union, quote, my everyday experiences as a chemistry professor at an American university in 2021 bring back memories from my school and university time in the USSR. Not good memories, more like Orwellian nightmares. I will compare my past and present experience to illustrate the following parallels between the USSR and the US today. One, the atmosphere of fear and self-censorship. Two, the omnipresence of ideology. Three, an intolerance of dissenting opinions. Four, the use of social engineering to solve real and imagined problems. I mean, these are really searing words. They remind us, even as we sit here talking about the totalitarian regime in crisis in China, that a totalitarianism has crept in to American life. And Neil, of all places in the universities. Neil, it gets worse in California. Uh, the state legislature passed a law this year signed by the governor creates a medical review board uh, of doctors chosen by lawmakers. And if Jay Bhattacharya or Scott Atlas is accused of not uh, going along with conventional wisdom, they can be brought before the board and they can lose their medical license. So you're not just losing an academic position, you're losing your livelihood. But HR, Neil, Scott, what can you do, much like China, if you want to protest within the system, what can you really do within the system without losing your job or having to move to Austin, Texas, Neil, and create a university out of nothing? <laughs> well, my takeaways were, one, if you want academic freedom, uh, it's better to be Peter Thiel than John Cochran, uh, because the, the real academic freedom comes when you can Money. afford <laughs> to take on the authorities. There's nothing right. like a vast uh, portfolio of private wealth to give you academic freedom. It's the thing that most academics lack, because they're essentially... Uh, wage slaves. And two, the other takeaway for me is we're not going to solve this from within. There have to be new institutions. And that's why I'm such a keen proponent of the University of Austin. We're doing what we can here at Hoover. Uh, but I, I don't honestly think that we can transform the way that Stanford works any more than Taiwan can transform the way that the People's Republic of China works, if I may be allowed that analogy. Uh, I, I, I'm a little uh, more hopeful, and, and I will not short circuit. There's, there was a lot of what are the practical solutions in the conference, which we can't uh, um, talk about entirely today. A lot of the problem, though, is the conspiracy of silence among the uh, people of goodwill who are not willing to stand up. So the first thing we can do is simply shine a light on what's going on. Uh, most people in this country, um, most voters who pay for all of this stuff, have no idea on, on the sort of insidious cancer going on in the bureaucracy. So mm -hmm. if you simply have conferences where you say things like this and put it up on the web and people can find out about it, uh, I think I think that that because it is so ridiculous <laughs> that just simply a light shown on it, I think people of common sense can eventually prevail. And they also need to, um, there's a lot of people I've talked to who um, say, well, I'd love to join you guys, but I'm afraid, and I don't want to be seen with right-wing nut jobs and lunatics and so forth. Well, you know, stand up, have a little courage and say, yes, uh, we have we have problems. It just takes the people of goodwill to stand up and, and say that this is crazy. And I think some of the worst, because the worst part is not just the Twitter mobs, it is the takeover of university bureaucracies, professional societies, granting agencies, funding agencies. Uh, that That's really, um, that, that that's the thing that gets you. And we, we didn't talk about much, but the, I learned about the what's going on in teaching 
um, you know, the educational side of it is just as drastic because it's important to not just to advance new knowledge, but to pass on knowledge to the next generation and to pass on habits of critical thought. And it was kind of striking on, on things you're not allowed to say in the classroom anymore. HR, any thoughts? Well, I, I think Neil's right that I think that, you know, the, there is a, you know, an important effort ongoing uh, to set up an alternative. But I do think we can't just sit back and, and, and allow you know, this sort of orthodoxy associated with these reified philosophies that are nonsensical uh, to continue, you know, and, and in the courses that I teach, I just ask questions, you know, and we, and we do discuss openly uh, the assumptions that underlie uh, m- many of these philosophies. I'm, and I'm talking about the range of sort of postmodernist, um, you know, critical theories uh, associated with, you know, with race and gender and so forth. And, you know, a question just to ask, a basic question is, do you really think it's a good idea to to judge people based on their identity category, you know, ra- rather than the elements of their character, their dedication, their empathy for one another, their their intellect, their work ethic, and and of course, you know, the, the answer it, 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 from almost everybody is no, that's not right. So rather than you know throwing out you know just uh, the, the terms that are that are often you know really um, uh, you know, hot button terms that generate vitriolic discussions. I think just asking questions, and I, I put more faith in the students. I think that over time, students are going to refuse to be cyber bullied, you know, or bullied on, you know, bullied on social media to conform uh, to these ideas. Because to, to many of the students that I talk to, it, these these philosophies make no sense to them either. And I think that there is a natural tendency on the part of university students to question any orthodoxy, and I think that's what we have to encourage them to do. I worry as well about this this sort of orthodoxy creeping into the military. I wrote an essay about this several months ago, and it's an element of this essay in which I, I really lament uh, the erosion of the warrior ethos. And, and these ideas uh, associated with the whole range of kind of DEI um, initiatives, um, I, I think are inimical uh, to, to combat effectiveness because they are, uh, they, they divide you know, rather than than reinforce, they divide individuals um, rather than than form you know units uh, it, it cohesion that are that are that are cohesive and confident uh, in one another and trust one another uh, based on on that mutual trust and common purpose and and really kind of the affection that 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 uh, that, that uh, warriors have for one another in good units. So. You know, I, I think that this this is really destructive. The, these range of philosophies, uh, in, in large measure, because they do divide, but also because they rob uh, the younger generation, the, those who buy into this, of agency. You know, when you put the word structural and institutional in front of every problem, you leave people with just this toxic combination of of, of anger and resignation. So, I, I think another theme. Besides questioning, right the the, the you know the, the premises of these of these um, these these philosophies uh, is to is to try to restore agency. So, John and Neil, uh, is your impression wokeism is it a is it a fever or is it a chronic disease in universities? It's a political ideology, which uh, serves as the Bolshevik one does. The more ridiculous it is. Uh-huh. The more when you stand up and, and learn to speak it, you signal that you're part of the crowd. And the more right. you can force people to stand up and say ridiculous things, uh, the more you can clamp down on them politically. So it's a it's a badge of a political movement, uh, in my view. Uh, and, you know, for the moment, uh, unlike Stalinist Russia, we don't take people out and shoot them when they can't say it. Uh, <clears throat> but it is an attempt to uh, take over the institutions of civil society and and we fortunately have structures that can fight back. I think the distinction between fever and chronic condition isn't the right one. It's better to think of it as a pandemic. Uh, it's often uh, being called a mind virus. Uh, I think it was Richard Dawkins who first coined that phrase, and it, it spreads rather like a virus. Uh, and that's why I'm much more pessimistic than my colleagues who seem to think that there is a pendulum that will swing back uh, to the center. It won't. Uh, the, there isn't a pendulum because the structures uh, have been so thoroughly infected by the mind virus uh, mm-hmm. that anybody who tries to uh, move it back into a center ground of academic uh, freedom is extremely vulnerable uh, to what we casually call uh, cancellation. And that's really 
uh, one of the the obvious symptoms of the pandemic that that, that those who resist are, are in fact are cancelled. So I, I I'm much more pessimistic about this. I think once the institutions infected, uh, behaviours fundamentally change, and the risks of uh, of heterodox behaviour become really high. And the higher uh, the, the the higher the risk, the the lower the status. It's very risky if you're an undergraduate, uh, and and even for a tenured professor, it's risky. Uh, so I I think this is this is this is, is a kind of mind virus problem, and I I don't see a vaccine. Uh, on the contrary, what I what I see is that most institutions get infected, and then it spreads from the universities to the military, uh, and we could mention many other sectors that have been affected in the same way. So that it, major corporations have to have their diversity, equity, and inclusion officers and statements. Uh, so we're in the midst of a pandemic which is much more contagious than the the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, as my ten year old son said, because you can get it from the internet. But it's not an individual virus. It's a social contagion. I mean, for the moment, it's I go along with this because that's what I do need to do to keep my job with a very small uh, fraction being true true believers. And I think that's where HR and I still have hope that, um, you know, that so much of this is vested in the takeover of university bureaucracies, funding agencies, uh, disciplinary procedures and so forth. That, but why would uh, these institutions ever change once they're under the control of the the woke of the people with the mind virus at what point are those institutions going to vote for real intellectual diversity they're not going to do it uh, and so it's not a pendulum there is i keep telling people there is no pendulum in academic mm-hmm. life it, it, it it's if you just look at the history of universities there aren't these processes that we're imagining here where a university becomes very right wing but then self corrects and comes back to the center that did not happen in the german universities i think i pointed this out right. at the stanford conference on the contrary the german universities went further and further and further to the right from the 1910s through to the 1940s and the, and remained conservative institutions even after after Germany had been bombed to rubble. It wasn't until full-blown academic revolution in 1968 that that changed and the German universities then began to move off in the opposite direction towards the left. So I think it's it's a fantasy to imagine that these things are self-correcting. Uh, I don't think they are. No, and, and the meritocratic research university is such a rare and recent invention. That's something else we tend to forget. And I, I should have plugged Neil Ferguson's beautiful comments at the uh, at the conference, but I I didn't want to uh, overdo it to ourselves. And and for HR, you know, it's not just divisiveness. Um, if a generation is brought up from primary school on, I mean, we talked about universities, but the takeover of the education establishment was was crucial here. You know, if you have a generation who believes that America is a colonialist, racist um, uh, uh, institution who has no reason to be there, why would you pick up a gun? And- and, and fight for this and put your life on the line for it. Your humble moderator is not just lazy, but he's now going to hog the microphone for a minute. And I want to make Neil Ferguson's eyes roll by bringing up sports. But we're going to talk about a sport that Neil is actually quite fond of, and that is Scotland and soccer. Uh, actually, maybe a sore subject for Neil because Scotland's in a bit of a World Cup drought, I believe. What, 1998, Neil? Been a, last time. Been a well, while. I think, while. They have, I think they have four well. players playing for the Australian team, though. That's right. Uh, you know, you, you can't keep the Scots out of the World Cup. Uh, of course, we're boycotting this World Cup in protest against uh, the the terrible human rights record of the host country, Qatar. Uh, I wish that I wish that were true. Uh, so let's let's go with that. I have two questions for you. First of all, the U.S. Soccer Federation briefly the other day on its Instagram account uh, showing an image of the Iranian flag and taking away the emblem of the Iranian Republic. Neil, play on, or is penalty for this? Oh, I can't get terribly worked up about about that. There's a long tradition of sports uh teams and and sporting uh individuals making political gestures whether it's at the world cup or 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 at the olympics and uh that seems to me to be a part of uh of of sporting freedom uh Mm -hmm. just in the same way as the german team made their protest with their multicolored armbands uh so uh Long may there be uh, a little bit of political protest at an event like this. Uh, I don't remember there being quite so many protests when Russia held the World Cup, but uh, but such is such is life. The, the real question, surely, we should be asking is, uh, when are Americans going to accept that this is just a better sport uh, than the one they mostly 
watch uh, and call misleadingly football. I mean, this is football. Explain why. Well, the thing about American football is that it's overwhelmingly tedious. It's like a, a terrible mutant robo version of rugby, uh, which constantly stops just as it's getting interesting, and which the rest of the world has quite reasonably decided not to play. Everybody else plays uh, what Americans call soccer. Uh, that's why it's a World Cup, not like the World Series, which only Americans participate in uh, in baseball. Canadians. And, Cana don't forget the Canadians. I, I, I almost <laughs> did. But both Canada and the United States are at this World Cup, unlike uh, Scotland. I think that's great. It's produced already some exciting uh, football. I'm going to call it football. I'm done with calling it soccer. All right. So, Neil, in 2022, the World Cup lands in Qatar, and not exactly an ambassador of human rights. 2018, it lands in all places, Russia. Can you explain a bit about FIFA, the soccer governing body, how it comes to these conclusions? And is there a way to perhaps save the World Cup and do it in a better venue than these two pretty shabby countries? Well, the thing about football is that it's it's been a professional sport for longer than more or less any other sport. Right. Uh, people were playing football for money 100 years ago. And there's even a good short story about this by a man named Yaroslav Hasek, who describes a Scotland team playing a Czech team in about 1910. And the Czechs are filled with patriotic fervor, but the Scots are only playing for the money. So it's a professional game, and it's accordingly been uh, run by venal individuals and organizations for a very long time too. And so the World Cup... Uh, is bound to be held periodically in dreadful places with lots of money. It, it can't really only be played in wholesome countries because there aren't really that many wholesome countries. And we'd all get bored of Sweden after a few years. So this is just the way the World Cup is. It, it, it goes from one dodgy place to another. And, and we, we grumble about it. We're grumbling about it more this year than we did when it was played in Russia. And I think that's rather a shameful thing, considering that Russia was not exactly uh, smelling of roses when that World Cup was held. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it just comes with the territory of a professional game. Mm -hmm. HR, okay, we're, recording I'm... we're recording this on a Monday, HR. the uh, Sorry, John. Uh, uh, by the time most people are watching this, the United States will have played Iran. Uh, is it anywhere analogous to the U.S.-Soviet hockey game in 1980, or were Americans just not there with soccer and just not there with Iran vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets? <laughs> well, I mean, I think they're not there with soccer, despite Neil's best efforts, man. I mean, uh, watching the, the U.S. and England, that was a great match, but it, like, it ended in a 0-0 tie. I mean, how was that exciting? I mean, I just, and, there was, I and there was no that. beer. Thank so, you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, you know, the only physical contact is when somebody feigns an injury. You know, on the on the fields, which you know, of course, uh, is one of the reasons why I'm bi more biased toward rugby than uh, than soccer, Neil. So, so I, I uh, and and if I had to pick football over uh, you know American football over soccer, I would pick American football, even with the commercial breaks and the huddles and everything. Which I, I'm with you. I I really I don't like it either. But but um, you know, I I hope that that Americans understand that this, this Iranian team actually made a very courageous gesture during the first right. match. Uh, the Iranian team did not sing their national anthem. They stood with their chins up with really looks of, of defiance uh, toward the theocratic dictatorship that continues to victimize it, its own people uh, after the murder of Maha, uh, Masha uh, Amini uh, and uh, and the protests that that, that followed and are, and are ongoing in, in Iran. So so I, I think you know in this case this isn't the Red Army team that the Philadelphia Flyers beat the hell out of, which that, that's a, that was a great match too, Bill. Um, but but uh, I do I do want to see the U.S. win uh, because I do think that that will uh, and and also to be gracious in that victory. I think seeing the images of those teams trading jerseys at the end, I hope those are played in Iran uh, as well. So I, I see nothing but good coming out of this match, no matter who wins. But of course, I want the U.S. to, to prevail. Bring us full circle. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, when Chinese viewers watch the World Cup, uh, the crowd is blurred uh, so that you can't see that the fans don't have masks on. You can only clearly see the players. Uh, such is the madness of Xi Jinping that he, he has to conceal uh, from the Chinese people that in Qatar, 
uh, not exactly a free society. People can nevertheless watch football with uh, with without without masks. Uh, HR, of course, is in error uh, in thinking that that football isn't a contact sport, as anybody who's ever played it will confirm. Uh, and we don't wear the kind of suits of armor that American footballers wear to protect themselves from the contact. Uh, th there's a reason American football isn't really played anywhere else, HR, and that is that it's a terrible game. And the reason that football, which of course was invented uh, in the British Isles, the reason it's played everywhere is that it's a great game. And life is full of nil-nil results. It's full of zero-zero ties. Uh, you've got to get used to that about life. Football accustoms you to life's reality that very often the score is zero-zero. And you just have to deal with that. American football, like all American sports, gives excessively high scores that are not reflective of the human condition. So I, I got to hold up. It's these <laughs> darn immigrants coming in and dumping on our national pastime. They have their boring run around a field in the mud, zero, zero games that go on and on forever. Football, you know, what makes the American military so great is they all grew up playing football and with immensely complicated plays, beautiful person to person coordination. Yeah, a little bit of a concussion problem, but but what the heck. Uh, the point I want to take of it, because I, I don't watch uh, I, uh, either uh, too much, though, I, I have to pass on my my uh, father-in-law's technique for watching football. He tapes it, and then he zips through the huddles, and there's about 20 minutes of uh, of wonderful action there. Uh, he should I was make that available as a public service. I love the idea of kind of high-speed American football. Uh, it would be a completely different viewing experience. It would be like it would be like rugby league. Is what it would be like, Neil. Actually, <laughs> yes. actually, kind of I was right. impressed by that's a I damning wanna, comment in my view. I want to go back to your po politics stuff. <laughs> go ahead, John. The, the Iranian media, who is is complaining at the U.S. and hurled an, an invective of beautifully smoke, uh, beautifully spoken American wokeism at how terrible the United States was. And I think one of the uh, one of the um, uh, corrective uh, salves for our, our problem is when people take uh, take our, our propaganda seriously and say, what do you mean? You know, U.S. is racist, imperialist, colonialist. How dare you? Uh, that that came up uh, at the climate conference. We didn't talk about the other great meeting of people going on private check jets to hot Middle Eastern countries <laughs> was the great climate confab last week, which I enjoyed in a, a similar way when when uh, all the countries of uh, which you're supposed to call the developing world, said, oh, wait a minute, you mean Western countries are imperialist and exploitative and and have, and have the climate disaster is currently already uh, hurting us marginalized peoples? How about some money? <laughs> and there was a very embarrassed, well, well, we didn't really mean it that much and certainly not to the tune of billions of dollars. So I love little, uh, I love Greta Thunberg because, um, you know, everyone else goes to school and they say, oh, it's a climate disaster. It's the end of the world. Uh, Civilization is going to end in 10 years. And everyone else says, yeah, can we go out and play soccer now? And Greta says, well, if that's true, we should be doing something about it, right? How dare you? So, uh, so it, perhaps uh, this is an instance also seen at the World Cup that uh, when, when our opponents take our propaganda seriously, that might make us uh, think twice about it. That's well put. I want to close out with a question to Neil. Neil, are you familiar with The Curse of the Bambino? No. It's an American baseball term. The Curse of the Bambino, John Smiling, he knows that it's Babe Ruth being traded from the Boston Red Sox to the New York Yankees, and then the Red Sox oh, going. Oh, yes. I something remember like, this. People something would bring this like 80, up when I was right. at Harvard, and I was expected to know about it. Yes, yes. Well, the, so the Red Sox trade Babe Ruth. They go something like 86 years without a World Series. Question, it, it, Scotland has not been in the World Cup since 1998. Is there a curse of Ferguson at play here? If you went back to Glasgow, would that improve Scotland's fortunes? Uh, well, it's been a long time since I lived in, in Glasgow. Uh, I think I was 11. And, uh, of course, if it would lift the curse and get Scotland into the next World Cup, I'd, I'd do it. But I don't think it works quite like that. Uh, the, the interesting thing about about football as a sport is that you need to have a, a reasonably large working class of people engaged in quite physical activity who are therefore fit enough uh, to run around for 90 minutes. And with deindustrialization, Scotland began to run very short of those people. There are plenty of them in Brazil to, to, to pick one of the countries that, that right. continues to produce uh, extremely strong 
football team. So I don't think my going back to Glasgow could change that. Uh, I think the economic history of football is one of the world really interesting subjects and the, the relationship between a country's economic development and its ability to field a good soccer team is one that I'm sure there must be great papers on in journals that only John reads. Uh, but no, I, I don't think I don't think my going back to Glasgow would change anything. Scotland yeah. will fail to qualify for every World Cup for the rest of my life with 80 percent probability. You know, maybe if England, Scotland and Wales got together and became one country, that might help. Well, <laughs> this has been tried, of course, in rugby, where the British Lions do play uh, games occasionally as a, the barbarians, as a, as a side, along with, it should be said, Ireland. Uh, but in, in soccer or football, to come back to my point, the economics is against it. So the self-interest of the English Football Association and its Scottish and Welsh and Irish counterparts precludes any possibility of a British team. And it's probably just as well because it would be much harder to justify underperformance if we had a, a United Kingdom football team. Uh, and, and then we, we really wouldn't have an excuse. Whereas I can always... I can always laugh if England get knocked out by some second tier country as a Scotsman, because somehow I'm not implicated. Well, you know, we sometimes make long term predictions here. I'm going to predict that USA rugby is going to become much, much better, much more credible. Sadly, the U.S. team did not qualify for next year's World Cup uh, because of a, they it went down to a tied match with Portugal. Uh, disappointing. It's important, important very disappointing it's, HR. It's very and, disappointing. But the US and I is know host, that that's the real World Cup. That's the World Cup that counts. The US, the US will host uh, the Rugby World Cup in 2031. And I predict great improvements between now, now and then. More US universities are now playing more American players. Certainly the service academies, you know, Army, West Point is the reigning collegiate champion. And those are obviously all US players. So I, I think that, you know, the sport is really uh, gaining momentum here in the US. And, you know, I'll tell you, it's great for parents too, because if they're looking for an alternative to American football uh, and the head injuries, I mean, kind of counterintuitively, rugby is a much safer sport because of the way that you teach form tackling. And right. also there's no blocking. So you don't get blindsided and get your legs cut out from under you. So I, I think that, you know, rugby is, I, I think is a pure sport, constant action. Um, and you know, you, you don't have to put up with the, the feigning of injuries that, I mean, that's what really gets me I about, get bad news about news soccer, today. man. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. In yeah, rugby, man. you get real injuries. There's no doubt. What, what but, counts, that's a bad what news, counts John. In a sport, what counts in a sport is a large number of people who do this when they're young, in part to be the fan base and in part to be the, the pool of talent. Nobody young is, is playing uh, rugby in the U S people, young people in the U S are playing a lot more soccer and a lot less football and a lot less baseball. Uh, and so you don't, you know, N Norway. Has no, there's a there's a lot there's a lot more there's a lot more rugby being played. There really is. I mean, uh, across the country, it's catching on their youth leagues. I mean, it's and all you need is a, all you need is a mouthpiece and and you know maybe one other element of protective gear, uh, and and your and your boots, your rugby boots, and you're good. That's all. You don't need a helmets or anything else. So here's a prediction to end our <laughs> show with. Yes. That by the end of this century, there will. There'll have been a definitive decline, if not extinction, of the established American sports. American football will have been replaced by rugby. Uh, soccer, football will uh, will replace other ac activities. Basketball will be forgotten. Uh, and as for baseball, that too will have vanished, just as George Will has been predicting for for years. So I I think this will be one of the great historic tectonic plate shifts of the next. Basketball uh, remains played because you can do it inside in the winter. <laughs> uh, but uh, other than that, I'll go with And it. what Americans do with their weekends will be a topic for another show. Gentlemen, let's leave it there today. Uh, great conversation as always. I hope you all enjoyed your Thanksgivings, by the way. We didn't talk about that, but I hope you had good holidays with your families. On behalf of my colleagues, Neil Ferguson, H.R. McMaster, John Cochran, the very talented people behind the scenes who make this broadcast possible. We'd like to thank you for watching Goodfellows today. We'll be back at the show in about a week from now. Stay tuned. And the best way to keep in touch with us, to stay abreast of us, is to subscribe to our show. Leave some comments. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you'd like to hear. Who like to see on the show we watch and we listen to your comments thanks for watching our show today and we will see you soon if you enjoyed this show and are interested in watching more content featuring hr mcmaster watch battlegrounds also available at hoover.org
I thought I was asking the academic freedom question. I thought that was my question. Okay, so so what do you guys want? What do you guys want to talk about? 